Good evening and good morning uh, to those who are in Europe. Welcome to the day three of European Research Days Japan 2022. And I'm uh, Tatsuya Maisawa, I'm the country representative at EuroAccess Japan. Also, I would like to extend my thanks to German Academic Exchange Service, they are the regional office Tokyo, which is a co-host and has generously provided the venue for the whole event. Of course, our thanks also goes to the German Embassy in Japan for providing financial support for live streaming setup. So, European Research Days Japan 2022 is the annual flagship event of EuroAccess Japan and its partners. In the past two days, we have discussed about research achievements and career paths for the European researchers in Japan. Also, we have explored collaboration and career development opportunities uh, with European partners. Today, we will feature research and science from different perspectives, such as how to become effective science communicator and um, how to change a career path from academy, uh, academia to industry or vice versa to realize your true potential. To discuss this, we have invited distinguished guests to today's round table. But before we get started, let me introduce you to Slaven Mislijenicevic, Policy Officer at the Directorate General for Research and Innovation, European Commission, to give his opening speech. Ladies and gentlemen, both online and on site in the German Cultural Center in Tokyo, I am delighted to participate in the 2022 European Research Days. I want to thank and congratulate Euraxis Japan, its partners, and anyone that was involved in co-creating this event that brings together researchers, innovators, and practitioners from across Japan and beyond. It is inspirational to see how passionate the organizers are about their work and the European Commission is particularly proud for having supported EURAXIS Japan in its activities throughout the last years. EU and Japan both share a long tradition of expanding the frontiers of knowledge and a strong commitment to scientific and technological innovation. And therefore, it is a welcomed development that the EU and Japan agreed to launch the exploratory discussions on Japan's possible association to Horizon Europe. And there are many benefits, both for Japan and EU, to reap from close cooperation. For example, on digital issues, as we both share a human-centric approach to digital transformation. And this is not just about reinforcing research and innovation ties. It is about allies and like-minded partners teaming up to together face global challenges. And this is exactly where Euraxis plays a crucial role. Because we often talk about excellent research, but behind excellent results, we have excellent individuals our researchers, and it is our responsibility to take care of them. Because eventually, we rely on our researchers to come up with solutions to the current and future pressing challenges. Your access has been supporting mobile researchers, both in and outside Europe, now for more than 18 years, with finding the right opportunities, providing information on a, on a variety of topics and providing career development services but mostly by making the move to another country a little bit easier events such as this one offer an accessible platform in which everyone who wants to participate in science and share knowledge can support the establishment of new connections between science and society, and this in an open, innovative, playful and sincere way. That's also why I'm looking forward to the next session regarding how to present 
in a fascinating way your research results. Communicating science with a broad audience is a science of its own, but it is extremely important as science is a collaborative effort, not only among researchers, but also between scientific community and the rest of society. So I encourage everyone who is present here today to embrace the opportunities of the European Research Days to contact your, your, access, um, your, your, your access contact points in Japan and to together explore new perspectives, discuss with different disciplines and sectors and gain a better and deeper knowledge about all kinds of topics. Have a good afternoon. Now let us begin uh, the roundtable discussion. For the guest speakers, please go up to the stage and take a seat. So we will welcome the questions uh, to speakers during the session. For those who attend here on site, please raise your hands if you have uh, any questions to the speakers. And for those who are watching live stream channel, so you can post your questions on the slide or during the discussion. The link to the Slido is displayed in the description box under the screen. We'll convey your questions to the speakers. Uh, once again, hello to everyone, and thank you very much for coming today. Today's roundtable is designed to discuss more about career development uh, for researchers. Throughout the three-day event, uh, we have highlighted the importance of diversity in science especially in terms of gender. But uh, we can also point out that we, and maybe young students like you, um, um, sorry, uh, maybe uh, don't know very much about how diverse your career paths can be. So it seems like there are kind of invisible walls between academia and industry, or between your country and abroad that seem hard to break down. So I would say it's very important to ask, uh, is there any wall to hinder transfer from academia to industry or the other way around? How can the transfer be done? And how is EU and Japan cooperation relevant? So to discuss these, we have invited six panelists you see here on the stage and who have backgrounds both in academia and industry, as well as Japan and abroad. Let me briefly introduce uh, our panelists in order of the seating closest to me to the remotest. So, Dr. Helmut Vanish, he is the head of Digital Sales Excellence Department at Siemens KK. And next, uh, Dr. Ileona Hoffman, uh, she is uh, working for uh, R&D Center at Teijin Nakashima Medical, CL Limited. And next, uh, Mr. David Gonzalez Filoso, uh, embedded systems engineer at Monochrome uh, Company. And the next, uh, Mr. Hainam Nguyen. Uh, he is a research associate at Institute of Production Engineering and Machine Tools. Uh, um, uh, Leibniz University, Hanover, and he's also a visiting researcher at Keio University in Tokyo. And next, Mr. Talash Malek. He is uh, also a research associate at the Institute of Production Engineering and Machine Tools, Leibniz University, Hanover, and also visiting researcher at Keio University. And the last and not least, uh, Dr. Antonio Tejero de Pablos. Uh, he's a research scientist at AI Lab and Cyber Agent. Okay, welcome. Now let's start uh, with exploring who you are and what you do in Japan. Focusing on the maybe topic of EU and Japan collaboration. So you can introduce yourself first and including how does your current or past position relate to EU-Japan collaboration? Thank you very much for the a nice introduction. Um, I'm since 23 years now in Japan. I came to Japan 
with the EU uh, Japan uh, Postdoc Fellowship to Tohoku, Tohoku University in Sendai. So I did uh, research in Sendai on the field of optoelectronics, uh, light emitting diets, lasers, gallium nitride. Um, after two years as a postdoc, I joined Sony in the research labs uh, 2000 and worked basically in uh, research in, on the blue laser diode for uh, PlayStation or optical drives, uh, Blu-ray um, until 2006. Um, then I did an MBA uh, in Tokyo and I switched in Sony to technology strategy. And there I was again looking at uh, EU projects. I was, for example, looking at uh, is Sony in Japan have contributing or participating in EU projects, or is always only Sony in uh, Europe participating. And uh, then 2011, I... Uh, switched to Siemens, where I'm working now, was doing for six, seven year, years technology scouting, uh, looking uh, which uh, technologies are existing at Japanese universities, which can benefit uh, my uh, company, and setting up uh, R&D projects uh, together. And now my current job has nothing to do with research anymore. So it is uh, sales support, it is uh, internal, digitalization, uh, running the customer relationship management system, running uh, online stores and so on. My name is Ilona Hoffmann, thank you for the introduction. And I work for Teji Nakashima Medical, which is a medical device company located in Okayama, which is uh, uh, halfway between uh, Osaka and Hiroshima. And I came to Japan thanks to uh, the German academic exchange uh, services. I um, was in the uh, Japanese language and practical experience in Japan program eight years ago, so I'm SP31. <laughs> and um, I was lucky that I was able to do my internship at the company that I was, I'm working at right now. So after the internship was up, they asked me whether I would um, be open to working for them, and I gladly agreed to that. And ever since, I've been working at their R&D department, where I'm developing um, new surface structures for um, implants. So our company specializes in artificial hip joints, uh, sorry, artificial joints, mainly hip joints and knee joints, but also spinal fixation devices and fracture fixation hardware. So um, we're looking into surface structures and also coatings that help to bond the implant to the bone in order to achieve a stable fixation. And also around that, it's not just the surfaces ex it themselves, it's also how you fabricate these. They are extremely intricate and therefore hard to manufacture with traditional um, manufacturing methods. So we're also using a lot of metal 3D printing and that's what I'm currently working on. Hello everyone, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is David. Um, I've been here in Japan for four years now. Uh, when I came to Japan, I came for a double degree uh, student uh, program uh, between my university in Madrid, uh, Madrid Technical University, and Keio University here in Japan. So it was a two years program uh, uh, with uh, one more year uh, I did already in Spain. And I spent like two years uh, doing research for my master thesis uh, about uh, control engineering for uh, next generation uh, Wi Fi 6. Um, then, uh, after uh, finishing my master thesis, uh, I was looking into a PhD uh, program or uh, moving to the industry. Uh, and I found that like, uh, Tokyo is a very interesting place for startups. So uh, I started working on an AI startup. Um, I worked there uh, for a year, uh, kind of in the middle between AI research and applied AI for companies. Um, and then after working one year there, I moved to my current company, uh, which is called uh, Monochrome. It's a smart home uh, 
company. So right now we are building smart houses in Japan, uh, facing different challenges about integrating different systems uh, for the all uh, inside the house. And yeah, and I think that would be all for me. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, it is very interesting. Like you mentioned that you ha uh, you're doing the startup in Tokyo. Maybe you can hear about that later on. Hi everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Hai Nam Nguyen, and I'm doing now my PhD at the Leibniz University of Hanover. And uh, in my master, I studied industrial engineering. So I have a background in economics and engineering. And after that, I choose to do my PhD or continue with studying in mechanical engineering field, more in the field of production engineering. And uh, to summarize the project I've done or I've done so far is that we're looking at specific processes in machine tools and try to use simulation methods and other modeling methods to um, yeah, set specific um, properties of the work pieces we want to reach um, after the machining process. And uh, it's great that you have, or you can look in, in different fields like um, the machining process itself. So we are also able to do our own experiments in real machine tools and also looking at different modeling techniques and simulation processes and also a little bit of material science to understand the uh, interactions there. And uh, now I'm here since uh, three months in, um, at the Keio University as a visiting uh, researcher. So, and um, yeah, we do, or well, we have a cooperation with our institute, so we're doing some research project here and it fits to the current project I'm working, so that's my background here. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Talos um, and also I would uh, thank you for invitation and the nice introduction. So um, like Hainam, um, I'm from Hanover and um, studied maybe a little bit from my background. I studied uh, mechanical engineering and since 2019 uh, work at uh, IFW Institute for uh, production engineering and machine tools. Um, I, my business there is uh, somehow about um, additive manufacturing and uh, digitalization of this process. And here in Japan, as Hainam uh, explained, um, we are trying in our cooperation with uh, one, one of the lab of um, K University um, to develop this idea for hybrid and combined manufacturing processes and um, yeah, that was somehow a new start in um, post-corona time after uh, so much um, online and alone uh, working. Uh, we tried to start again our exchange and uh, cooperation uh, with um, the lab here in Japan, and uh, we hope that this time we can continue that. My name is Antonio. I work at the Japanese company called Cyber Agent at the AI lab, and um, I came to Japan um, nine years ago uh, with the Vulcanus program. I don't know if you guys uh, know about it. It's for uh, European students in science uh, courses that want to come to Japan for one year. So I did that. It was my, my chance to come here. And then I stayed for my PhD at the Nara Institute of Science and Technology. And then I worked at the University of Tokyo as a researcher for four years. And uh, two years ago, I moved from academia to my current uh, job uh, in the, uh, at the company. And my uh, field is uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So um, for example, during my PhD, I applied that for human behavior recognition. I applied it to um, automatic diagnosis in, during my uh, working years at the university. And now I'm applying it to uh, learning multimodal data, which is uh, image, video, um, sound, text at the same time, which may be easy, like, okay, so you train an AI to learn image and an AI to learn video and an AI to learn sound, and you put them together and you got it. But unfortunately, it's not that easy. So uh, that's why uh, kind of my challenge in research. And I think, yeah, the other question was how to, like, how I collaborate with 
you know, my, my position in the collaboration between Europe and Japan. Um, I'm actually enrolled at the Association of Spanish Researchers in Japan, and I'm trying to promote uh, the collaborations between Spain and Japan, which unfortunately are not really, there's not much going on, but uh, I hope, you know, similarly to France and Germany, I hope they can uh, collaborate together as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antonio. Uh, actually, yesterday we have invited the research, I mean, Spanish researchers uh, organization to this event. So maybe like we can continue the cooperation together. Then actually each of our panelists have uh, very diverse backgrounds and maybe uh, they already mentioned that why they came to Japan. So, but uh, what is the you know, what brought you to Japan? Like, why, as a scientist, uh, do work or research in Japan? What is the strength working in Japan? Do you have any comments on that? I mean, when, when I was a PhD student at the uh, University of Bremen and was uh, making my semiconductor lasers, they had a lifetime of uh, a few seconds or a minute but when I went to international conferences, there were the, the Sonys and Sharps and Panasonics and their lifetime was 400 or 500 hours, more close to uh, commercialization. So this is why I came to Japan to see why is this? Why is Japan so strong in optoelectronics? And I have to say I did not get the full answer at the university but I got almost my full answer in the research labs in, uh, or in the development labs in uh, Sony then, seeing how we could bring this device into the PlayStation 3 2006. In my case, uh, when I was a first year master's student in Spain, uh, I had the, uh, my university had a really good pro exchange program to do your second year of master uh, on a different country. And uh, I studied telecommunication engineering, uh, and I was really interested on control engineering uh, and how to mix both uh, fields. And among the, all the exchange options uh, I had, I thought like uh, Japan is, uh, I thought it was a really good place uh, to learn about control engineering. Uh, and about robotics too, and that's what basically made me uh, come to Japan uh, to continue my master and my and to do my master thesis on on control engineering for uh, telecommunications, basically. Thank you. So basically, like uh, Japan has its own strength in its, some fields, and maybe there is assistance to utilize that kind of uh, kind of situation environment. So it's kind of strength in Japan, strength in EU, like you know, trying to go beyond uh, across the borders to utilize those opportunities, maybe. Okay, anyone would like to add anything so far? Okay, then now let's turn on our attention to the transfer between industry and academia because uh, our panelists now work in industry and some of you still remain in the academia but do, if you still in the academia do you have any plans to go across the sectors and how this academia industry transfer is relevant to your life? Is there any strength in being in uh, industry to realize your goals and... I spent my career, if you want to say, all, all the time in industry. But for us, actually, well, since I work at the R&D department, collaboration with academia is crucial because we constantly need new input, new ideas, and new developments, and new research that people have basically prepared the basic science and they are understanding the processes and the science behind why something works that we can then try to commercialize and put it into a product that we can sell in order to help patients. So there's a lot of research going on behind the scenes and it's impossible for us as a company to do all of that from 
the start from the basic science, so we are more focusing on applying the science in order to benefit the patients. So we are basically, um, our, I see it as our task to take the science from bench to bedside so it can actually be applied for the good of humankind. Thank you. Any panelists? Yes, Antonio. Yeah, so uh, as I said, I, was, I worked uh, in academia for four years and I changed. Um, I didn't change because I didn't like academia research. I actually, uh, I loved it. I still love it. Um, the thing is, well, universities don't love giving you a stable uh, job. <laughs> so um, one of the trends that we can see, I mean, it, it, you know, uh, really big companies as Google, Facebook, and Amazon, and all those, Microsoft, they, they do keep, they, they create a, a, an AI lab within, the, you know, their, their institution, and so they have first-hand, you know, uh, invasions and discoveries that, you know, make, instead of coming from academia, they come from the inside. And, uh, but then they also let us, you know, publish our research, and it's nothing like, we don't do like hidden experiments, like everything we do, we publish it, like in academia. But I think industry gives you a more stable, I don't know, I, I feel like I'm playing my life uh, better right now than when I was at the university. Thank you. So, Basically, there's uh, small chances to remain in academia and more opportunities in industries. Of course, there is some um, opportunities in academia as well, but depending on your goals, you can maybe choose uh, opportunities. The problem is that maybe we don't know where the opportunities are. Then maybe let me ask the researchers, current researchers, do you have any uh, ideas, you know, applying your research to the, some industries or like uh, productions or what you want to keep, you know, doing your research at academia? Do you have any plans? So I think um, for me personally, the... Um Two three years, I can imagine that uh, I will start again in, in um, another industry. So after my study, I started in um, in one company in Germany, and after that, okay, I saw um, maybe I need um, more investment in myself, and therefore I uh, came back to university, do my uh, research, and uh, as a PhD student, and um, I think I will back um, I will be back to to industry. Um, and um, maybe I can connect this, this question with, with the last question somehow. Um, why to Japan and um, why we are here? Um, I think um, what is uh, mentioned before about um, technical background or um, something about career, something about research, that's true. Um, that's, that's, I think, a really big motivation to be, for example, here in Japan, if um, some institute uh, or, or university, if, I don't know, company, has really good work in this direction. But um, I think there is another part, um, but uh, especially, for example, we um, in uh, mechanical engineering uh, discipline in Germany have to learn, and that's uh, something about um, responsibility for uh, employee or uh, mm, somehow having um, 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 having uh, somehow um, um, training for for uh, b as a manager later, and um, being Japan uh, gives us um, this chance to um, face um, really another culture as we have in Europe. So, and then you can learn, okay, how you can f um, manage this challenge, uh, how you can um, have a good communication with, with your colleague here. Because you have some plan, for example, for us, for three months, we want to reach something, and uh, we came here and so, okay, uh, that's not uh, something what we thought. So, for example, we need, uh, we need more three weeks only for planning. So that's, that's because of different culture, different of, um, um, how the people here work, um, there is no good or bad or uh, correct wrong, that's uh, just different. And I think 
that's really big uh, um, point or, or important point to learn uh, during the research. And um, now back again to, to your question. Yes, I want to go back to industry. And I think this, um, this stay, um, I mean, staying in Japan uh, um, gave me so, so many important things um, to use later in industry. Thank you. So not only the like a knowledge, but also the cultural assimilation or like, you know, um, those experiences, overall experiences can be used for your future development, career development. And of course, you mentioned that you go across industry and academia easily, right? Not easily, maybe, but uh, you have. Uh, gone across those boundaries, you know, industry and academia and your country and Japan. So I think you kind of highlighted the importance of mobility between the sectors and the countries. Okay, thank you very much. And Helmut, do you want to? Yeah, yeah, actually, it's possible to do both also. So even now in my, uh, depends on the company, but so now in my uh, company at uh, Siemens, so I have at the same time uh, assignment at the National Institute of Technology in uh, Sendai to have some uh, influence uh, in the, their final project in the advanced courses. Uh, so I'm also going back from company again to uh, academia because I think I mean companies in the philosophy of open innovation uh, can never have all the intelligent people working for them so they have always to uh, work externally um, but this means that companies must be then also a little bit open in formulating their um, questions and their challenges. And so depending on the culture, companies can be maybe more open for this. And if companies are not so open for this, then of course the academia is struggling because they are doing something, but it has nothing to do with the real needs of the customers of the industry. So. To have a, a good culture that this works together is, I think, very difficult to uh, uh, build up. And, uh, but this is essential, of course, for um, good products the companies can then produce for their uh, customers. Um, the second small aspect I want to mention is, of course, also where are ideas coming from? So I. Uh, so in my career, of course, a lot of uh, engineers come up with ideas and maybe in this sense Japanese companies are quite good because it's uh, quite easy in my experience to convince your boss to give you uh, 50,000 euro and show something. Um, so almost like an internal startup company uh, with, without a lot of uh, strategy planning and uh, so on. But uh, I think a role of maybe um, foreign researchers also here in Japan being in research labs in companies could be to widen a little bit the, the view and uh, uh, that the use cases are not always mirroring the world like uh, Tokyo. That because the people who went here in Tokyo to university tend a little bit to think the world looks like Tokyo, and then products are made for Tokyo, but nobody else needs them in the world, potentially. So that's uh, one of the danger. Thank you very much, Helmut. I think he pointed out a very important uh, point, that uh, there is also um, problem between like you know maybe communication between industry and academia because uh, academia has to know what people needs for the the innovation or like solution to the problems in society or like to make products better and there must be some uh, communication between academia and industry and we have to facilitate it uh, better 
So I think you mentioned also strength and the the challenges in like you know in the communication between those two sectors. Maybe Antonio can add something about this academic industry um, uh, co connections or transfer. Right. Um, so. Um, yes, basically, it's, uh, yes, as, as it's been explained uh, before, uh, uh, companies, they, they need to, you know, provide technology and, and catch up and uh, develop new products, and uh, academia has to, like, they develop stuff, but they need to, like, they need somehow, you know, a way to put it out to the world, so that, that transfer, um, you know, it's it's crucial. Um, the, the important, yeah, the critical thing here is, is like here is that industries and, and uh, universities sometimes they don't speak the same language. And I'm not talking about Japanese or English or Spanish. I'm talking about like um, technologically or you know scientifically. Also, they like as researchers we want to like we don't want to sell stuff when some of them they want, but some of us we are not really interested. We want to like to create new things and ideas. Um, but we need to sell it somehow because you know, if, we, if there's no money, then you know, we cannot work. So um, that kind of you know, middle where it, it's necessary, the cushion between uh, both worlds. And uh, I think, um, well, it, it depends on the field. Um, I'm, I'm always talking about my case of uh, artificial intelligence. Um, and uh, maybe computer science, maybe there is, uh, you know, it's 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 maybe maybe different to other fields. But um, in in as I said, like big companies tend to get more and more interested in in um, you know, especially in AI. Everyone wants to do AI right now. They want to have AI stuff. Um, so they they um, they want to do research and they want to you know, um, they but they. When we tell them about writing papers, is this like for what? Can we sell them? <laughs> and we, we cannot sell papers, but you know that's how research works. And you know, letting the industry understand how the research process works, and also letting the, the the academia understand that you know you cannot just create stuff. Like we need to do something with it. We need to like put it out somehow. There there's some business that has to uh, go on. Um, so not these uh, like intermediate positions between like industry and academia. I think they are they are uh, getting more and more frequent. Uh, as I said, at least in my field, maybe in other fields is different. Thank you very much. Also, uh, David, uh, you're doing the startup, so you kind of changed your career path from academia to industry. Did you have any difficulties in, do, you know, making this that kind of choice, or it was very smooth? What do you say to it? So uh, it was actually uh, very easy to go from academia to uh, industry on a, on the startup environment because. Actually, when I was uh, looking for uh, startups and searching like uh, where I could work, I found that there are like uh, many startups here in Tokyo that uh, they come from uh, laboratories uh, from different universities. Uh, for example, some students doing some research and they found like a business application, and then they found uh, some investment and they created the company. And since it's, it comes from academia, those kind of companies. Uh, it's very easy to transfer from one to the other because they tend to keep the same uh, research mindset, let's say. Um, so, for example, in my case, uh, my first company I worked for, uh, they had a, a whole department only for research, and the head of the department uh, was uh, an assistant professor in Kyoto University, I think. So he also tried to keep uh, like the research department uh, very uh, like research focused and not focused on sales, let's say, which is like uh, what usually happens in companies that they try to do all the research only for sales. But in my case, and I think like in 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 Japan or in Tokyo, it might be easy to find because yeah, there are many uh, startups that come from a university. They 
keep this uh, research mindset where like you don't need to sell uh, from the beginning. You need to keep researching, like getting different ideas, uh, new developments, and yeah, if you might have a, a, a one product that you can sell, but uh, you you keep getting money from that uh, product, let's say, but then at the same time doing research to only for research or also to improve that kind of product. So I think this transfer between academia and startup industry is actually quite easy or like very easy to transfer between both uh, fields, let's say. Thank you. So in your field, it's more like um, smooth communication between researchers in academia and of course in industries like there is a lot of, you know, interactions maybe going on. Yeah, uh, actually, as it has been mentioned before, uh, one company cannot like do all, all research, and a startup cannot do all the research like university do. So it's really important to be in contact with uh, academia to get all that research power uh, to keep working on your on your business. Let's say so. It's really important to have this collaboration between uh, academia and startups. Thank you very much. So uh, it's, I think it's about science communication because you have to, um, uh, how you say, make them understood what you are doing, what you do in, in maybe in the research as a researcher and as a, in, in, I mean, who do the research in the companies, then they, you have to ask them to you know, do this kind of research, but you know, some, uh, some of the panelists say they use different languages or like, you know, maybe in different culture. So I think this scientific communication is very important. So I think the difficulty can come from that uh, different culture, different language in these two sectors. Then do you have any examples on that? And do, do you have any ideas how to um, make, make it better? Uh, I mean, like, you know, to communicate better between those two? I mean, I, I think at the end, the skill set is not that uh, different, actually, because, uh, I mean, when I see researchers now in my company, the, the managers, at least, from, from research teams, I mean, they have every year to get the budgets for their uh, team, and it's not that uh, they will get all their, their budget for their team, but they will get maybe uh, half financed, and from the other half, they have to find internal uh, businesses which are sponsoring them. So if there's an AI researcher or a robot researcher in my company now, he has to promote himself to the mobility people. How about applying robotics to uh, trains or how about applying it uh, for healthcare for the computer tomographs or so? And if a researcher in the company is not doing this, at least in my company, then his research team will be half next year and then a quarter and then it will disappear after three years. And I think it's, uh, it should be, at least what I still remember from uh, Germany or Europe, also in the ac academia. I mean, my professor at least, I mean, he was uh, going all the time around to get funding for our group so that we can have uh, funding by the you or by the government that we get better equipment. When we get better equipment, we get better and more students, we can make more publications. And so this kind of circle, I think also postdocs at least, or professors at universities should be almost uh, salespeople for their own uh, research. Um, I have to say that I see there a big difference in between Japan and uh, Europe in the academia, in the, in the want to do this, I want to get more money, I want to uh, get more students, I want to get more equipment. So I had, when I tried to set up projects between uh, my company and the Japanese universities, I had often the reaction of the professor, uh, no, I mean, we are not, not interested to work with. Uh, at least also a foreign company. Thank 
you. So you mentioned that uh, there is some kind of barrier between the foreign companies and in Japanese universities. And um, what about uh, Eliana? Do you have anything to add? So my observation is maybe the style of convincing someone seems to be very different. So in, in Europe or in the West in general, my idea is that you prepare some really strong arguments and then you make your case in front of your manager or a different company or maybe university that you want to do a collaboration with and you will either convince them on the spot or they won't be convinced. So it's basically all over in one session. But in Japan I found that you cannot convince people in one go. You have to make uh, the presentation or the approach again and again and again and again and maybe one day they'll buy into it. So you, you cannot give up after the first try. You have to keep pushing it and pushing it and maybe wait a little bit and then try again. Thank you. I think uh, there is obviously the cultural difference and maybe communication and style difference. But uh, as researchers in, uh, in Japan, I mean European researchers in Japan, you know how to overcome that kind of differences. I think Antonio has something um, to show us, right, about the uh, industry academy communication. Right, so, oh sorry. The, um, so yeah, was, I, I was always saying before, it may have sound that um, they, they give us money to just to write papers. When I say write papers, I mean, uh, you know, publishing academic uh, articles and stuff. But we, we also have to um, connect with the developers and whatever we, um, whatever research we do, we have to somehow, within the company, we have to, as, as you know, as, as they, they have said before, um, you know, show that, promote it to show that this can be used, this is useful, or um, we are not properly doing our, our job as a industry researcher kind of thing. So, the it, so we in our company in in Jap it's it's one of the few companies in Japan that take research to the like they let us be as in the academia but they try to make a profit of it for the company like somehow and um, not many companies in Japan do that and uh, we had a moment that was like okay let's wait let's try not be in contact with other companies and let's see how they are doing research, like what they are, what's their research and how they manage to do this transfer or how they, um, what's their attitude towards research in a company. And when I say research, I'm not talking about R&D, but just academic-like research. So um, we started doing this event called CCSE, Computer, uh, sorry, Conference on Computer Science for Enterprises, in which like, from 10 to 20 uh, companies uh, every time they participate. And is, we created this because we thought that, okay, there are academic, so there are research conferences for uh, universities, but um, what about like something more industry like? So this is a video of like how the event goes on. So we usually do it at the University of Tokyo. During COVID was online, but we are planning to do it again. So we had people from other companies, uh, other students, and all the presentations are purely research. And also companies have a chance to um, uh, introduce their research teams. Uh, we have panel discussions like these ones on like how is research managed at this or that company, so there are big companies such as Line, uh, Dico, uh, for computer vision especially. Well, this is mostly in computer science, so maybe not for um, materials or uh, chemistry. Um, so we had also, we have poster sessions, and uh, so this is a way for us to kind of smooth this, tr this uh, connection between uh, academia and industry. Because we figured out that there are a lot of uh, people in academia that they don't want to work at the industry because they feel like they are selling themselves to the devil. <laughs> but um, so this is like, so it's like, now companies try to make this environment where you are still like doing research, very basic research, but 
you're still in contact with developers and you know with people who actually produce and sell stuff in order to produce this transfer uh, like knowledge transfer in our companies it comes from the inside because we we researchers we do basic research from the inside of the company and but we still have to figure out like how to how do other other companies do this what other companies are doing to do like very basic research in their companies, at least in our, our field, computer science. So um, we, we prepared this event, and the next one it's coming too. Um, so uh, we hope to also have many uh, students and people from other companies to, to also do this kind of promoting transfer of knowledge. Thank you for uh, showing the video. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm proud to be able to show your event because this is very inspiring because I'm not from the natural sciences field. I'm a kind of social scientist, so it's very good to know what they're doing, right? <laughs> at the other side of the science. But thank you very much for showing us and you know the potentials that uh, the transfer or communication between the uh, two sectors have. And okay, thank you very much. Uh, Hainam, do you have anything to add maybe about the science communication because you are doing the research and you have to convince someone that your research is very good and is, you know, really good to be funded or something like that. What do you think the kind of aspect, science communication, what is the difficulty in, you know, doing this, um, you know, science communication? With a funding point, uh, it's important in our community to get that cycle of funding and publication. But in our community, sometimes the focus on funding is too strong than on the content. So that's a difference I could observe here. That here you can really work more freely and uh, can be really innovative. And uh, in aspect of communication, we also have uh, or faced different, uh, many different situations. And one example, I have to laugh a little bit uh, with the repetition. We also experienced that and have really to repeat ourselves many times. So that's also something we somehow learned here. And uh, because of language barriers, but also understanding barriers, uh, sometimes you don't get what the other side wants. and and vice versa. So it's really important to keep that repetition and uh, to fix that if a problem appears some weeks later, what you thought it's already solved or it's clear. So stuff like that that you don't um, yeah, have in mind and it's clear for you but not for the other side. So that's, um, yeah, belonging to a communication, you have to plan that and have in mind that you have to maybe you do everything again and plan this time in your projects if you have to face that. But it's also interesting, really interesting to experience that. Thank you very much for sharing your experience with us. So um, in Europe, a science communication is more like a professionalized uh, compared to Japan. And because as when you apply for the funding in Japan, or maybe same as in Europe, you have to write this thick of uh, the proposal, right? And you have to convince the umpire to, oh, this is a good science or something like that. But uh, about as a career, do you see any potential that science communication will be one good option for the young researchers or students? Helmut, do you have any ideas on this? I mean, kind of science uh, consulting and being somehow between the universities and companies, I could imagine, and I might miss something here in Japan, but uh, so I'm sometime still now after my long time in Japan uh, evaluating uh, EU projects uh, and I have impression that the how to make a project application is much more uh, professional in uh, Europe in the sense that there is maybe consulting companies who work with the different parties 
to ghostwrite the application actually. So I think uh, if I would be young again and could speak and learn fluent Japanese, maybe I would start a business in Japan in helping university researchers get uh, NATO projects uh, by finding out what are the characteristics for applications which go through and uh, share this knowledge then uh, among the participants. So that is maybe something like science communication, but this would be something I, I'm missing a little bit here. In, uh, because when, when I was uh, here doing technology scouting, I went many times to Tokyo University and I had projects actually with Tokyo University as Siemens, um, but it was always defined as the project. And then I was communicating with the professor, the professor gets some money for the project. I, I would love to have, have, have had more mechanisms of maybe funding a PhD student in your group as a, as a uh, company, or uh, maybe have uh, uh, I mean, in Germany we call Werkstudent, so have actually a Tokyo University student uh, work half year with me in uh, Siemens in Japan and doing a continuous uh, part-time job and uh, Arbeito, not in the uh, convenience store, uh, which might not help his uh, CV actually, but uh, work with me on maybe some uh, topics of, uh, actually I did uh, technology landscape AI in Japan, of course, and this is what students could do. So were there, are there such mechanisms in Japan to do this, or is this really very difficult from your Tokyo University uh, experience? So I think, um Universities are, are, are weird because, <laughs> um, you know, they, they are so full of stuff and like each lab is like a small company and there's so few, there, I was working as a staff in a, in a research lab at the university. We had to take care of so many things, you know, but very few people and uh, it's hard for them to figure out all that. It's, it's not as organized as a company. So that happening, coming from the university, I see, I see it's hard. So, but now from the, from the industry, um, I think it, maybe we have more idea and we can like propose. It all depends on how open the, the university lab and, and, and students, but students will do whatever the professor tell them. So if the professor is open-minded, then be more happy to like collaborate with industries. Um, what we have now is our, our, our lab at the company offers um, internships. And it's a full-time paid job. It's, it's, it's well paid, but you have to also work full-time. And that also helps. Well, that helps because it, it's for exclusively for PhD students, because we are talking about like doing research and maybe writing uh, an academic paper together. But um, then is, you know, for, for the first time there, for, maybe for the student, he has like the more how can I say, academic research from the lab, and they may find a way of how to apply that to one of the company things that we are moving, or, you know, it, it's, it's a good first contact for, for researchers. And uh, we, we try, like, as I said, like, there's not many companies like mine right now in Japan. They, they tend to be, yeah, science communication is not really happening that much in the country, but, um, for example, we, we are trying to, you know, encourage that through like full-time internships, just as you said, just come to work with us, learn uh, from us, and maybe we can learn from you too. And uh, I think that should be more like happening more often. So I think, but maybe in the future, who knows? <laughs> but thank you for the question. So what seems to be fairly uh, common in Japan is that a company hires students after their bachelor or master's thesis and then lets them work for the company for a couple of years and then sends them off to do their PhD at a university that they collaborate with. So this employer slash student is actually uh, financially supported by the company. So the company pays all the fees and tuition and also the salary of the student slash employee. 
And usually there's a research um, interest behind that. So you get your three, four years of actually closely working together with the lab at the university and yeah, with an agreed upon um, goal. So that's both the university and the uh, company profit from that. Seems to be fairly common in Japan. I would say like uh, I've had also that kind of a, a experience. So on my second year uh, of master thesis, I actually was working uh, part time uh, for a company. Um, so uh, yeah, I was doing like uh, yeah, working like learning the industry uh, how uh, the the business works uh, part time on that company. Uh, also paid, so that was uh, very helpful for living in Japan. And at the same time, doing my, my research, and it was actually very helpful to be in both at the same time. But um, yes, yeah, uh, Antonio mentioned, I think it's not that common. And uh, actually, it was not that easy to, to, make, to make it happen. Uh, basically, because the university is not, like the, the administration of the university was not ready for, for that, let's say. Um, so actually, uh, as also mentioned before, the manager of the of my company had to go like basically for two months, uh, like having like I don't know four five meetings with uh, my professor to kind of uh, understand what we wanted to do. Like I wanted to like work part time, learn uh, also how a company works, and while well, doing my research at the same time. Uh, and at the end, we couldn't make it happen, but uh, it's true that I saw that it's not as easy as in Europe. I think in Europe, for example, uh, the companies are aware that that is very helpful. They, sorry, the, the universities are aware that that's very helpful for their students. So they actually make agreements with the companies already. And as a student, you can easily apply to those, uh, those internships. Also, the companies want those kind of students. But here, I think, like, uh, there's still like a lot of work to do from the university side to help those kind of agreements with the companies uh, because it's not it's not that easy yet and I think it's, it would be really helpful for uh, Japanese uh, researchers and foreign researchers too in Japan. Thank you. I think the direction, I mean, the Japanese education and companies' direction goes to the same way to, as Europeans, like in a smooth. Uh, collaboration between universities and uh, companies. Well, uh, I'd like to uh, welcome the questions from the floor and online as well, uh, because uh, we have ten, uh, 15 minutes for the Q&A session. So since we have uh, st students from Germany, right? Then I would like to uh, hear some questions from the floor. Do you have any questions to the panelists? Um, thank you. I have one question to um, the researcher from Hannover. Um, earlier you said that uh, here being in Japan you learned a lot of, or you gained a lot of experience or maybe skills that might help you um, going back to industry later. And I was wondering uh, if you had any examples and if those experiences are specific to Japan or is it uh, more about just being in a different country and um, just learning new things in general? Thank you. Um, that's somehow really good question but hard to answer. <laughs> Um, because I'm, I'm afraid that um, what I say um, will be somehow generalized and um, I was only three and a half months here and I maybe say something and um, will be wrong understood. <laughs> um, I think um, about communication problem or um, language barriers, um, something like that, um, we, we discussed now, that's somehow a um, good example. Um, um, but I think um, the um, what I definitely um, take um, to Germany back and um, use that is somehow um, you don't need to change the people uh, or you don't need only say what you want to have. Maybe sometimes you have to change yourself. 
So um, if you see here, um, the people works um, in other way if um, they need uh, more time to think about things. I mean, that can be a proposal, that can be a timetable for a project, something like that. Then maybe next time you need to plan more for that. So um, you need a buffer for your time plan. Um, um, that's, that's something what I learned. And I think that's something that you have to experience in many of uh, books and um, courses, crash courses from management, something like that. You see, yeah, flexibility is really important. A management has to, um, or, or a manager has to uh, decide everything um, um, in, in one situation, something like that. But we can see still, I mean, we are sitting here and talking about so many um, things in Japan has to be changed, but we don't think, okay, maybe that's true or that's correct and we have to change something in Europe. Um, we are talking about uh, maybe a master program, something like that, but there is, um, there is a big difference between our master program uh, uh, or programs in Germany or in Europe and here in Japan. So in Japan is something like, uh, you you are doing research really in in Europe you are still student so you have to visit so many courses so uh, of course you will have uh, your free time your free time but if you are a researcher you don't have your free, free time so you have to work weekend too so the question is how you can work in in company and that, that, that's that, that's not maybe direct uh, example but what I wanted to say is, um, or what I learned about all of these this points, um, that I have to be flexible. Sometimes in, in a situation, I have to change myself, I have to change my plan, I have to change my idea. Um, because in, in a company, in industry, as um, people here uh, mentioned, uh, so um, the, the, in a company, the, the people think about money. Uh, or economic factors. So if that's the case, you cannot go there and say, ah, oh, okay, uh, here I have this, this, this. The other side, think only about one point. So you have to change your mind. And that's, that's really important things, I mean, in many different aspects. Um, I don't know if, if I could um, explain that, but uh, I think for me or for us is really uh, hard to, to give really good examples because as I said, I, I fear that, that that will be somehow generalized for, for this um, short time. Yeah, I can also add something. I think flexibility is really the key, so we have to learn to adapt ourselves here and also kind of understand a little bit the rule of the game. So also understand the people, what are their expectations, what are the messages maybe they try to say or don't say directly to you. And it's also if you're from study to working environment, you are in a new environment. So it's actually like us, we are in Japan in a new environment. And it's really this ability to, yeah, understand the environment, understand the rules of the game and adapt yourself and also be flexible to, yeah, try to understand it and don't judge directly see the differences and see how you can adapt with these situations. How can you yeah, maybe benefit from it and also use um, and understand the situation to use it for yourself, your own interests. So these are the things I think we could learn in these two months because the change was, yeah, I think harder than from my case, university to research. And uh, yeah, it's just the ability to adapt yourself in new environments. I think that's what you learn, can learn here a lot if you do your study in Japan. So it's a general ability you have to develop somehow later in the future too. So. Thank you very much. There are other questions, yes. Um, did you actually, or I mean, not all of you already do this, but for the people who are doing research in the industry, did you actually apply for a position, for a research position in the company? Because what I often see is that these, um, the open positions they look for, they don't actually say they look for research or they look for a scientist or whatever. They are open for everybody, but they are looking much more for like the application side. Um, so did you kind of end up in a research position inside the company 
after all these interviews and stuff and the discussions? Did you actually like say you want to do research in the company, uh, just out of luck and hoping that they have some research inside, or um, or did they actually yeah like looking for a scientist directly and you were just applying for this rather straightforward um, way? So I would like to hear about about this a little bit. Thank you. Yes. So I think um, here we need to make a distinction between Western and Japanese companies in the way they hire people. So in Japan, usually the hiring process is different depending on whether you are hired on right after you finish your academic education or whether you have a couple of years of uh, working experience and then get hired. In the former case, usually you just get hired, I want to say, in bulk. So the company decides they want to hire X people this round, this spring, and then you're in the group. And you, you can say, well, I'd prefer to work in R&D, but they may end up putting you into marketing. So you, you can state your preferences, but you have, eventually you have no say in where you're going to end up. If you are being hired with a couple of years of work experience, then you will be directly applying to a specific role within the company. And then that will say R&D director or senior scientist or something like that. And then you know where you're going. Yes, Antonio. Yeah, so um, I, I have experienced the, the unique uh, Japanese uh, job hunting thing. Um, didn't really like it. Um, so y what happens is I, I, I had to make sure, very sure, like I had to do my research on like what the company, like who's working on that company, what kind of job they do, and I had to figure out by myself if they had a research department or not. And, or maybe no, or trying to email someone there who could tell me about. And uh, if you want to do research, maybe you don't want to like start from, from the, without asking anyone, you don't want to maybe start from, like all the maybe newly graduate uh, procedure because it's, it's very annoying. And uh, as, uh, the, as the previous comments, uh, it, it doesn't really, you don't really know where they're going to put you. They're trying to put me on sales because I was a foreigner and I could speak languages. So, but I was like, no, <laughs> I didn't write, wrote that on my entry sheet, which was uh, another thing that I had to do. Um, um, so you, you have to maybe know someone who knows someone or maybe be like, do your research before applying to the company. Um, if you are a PhD, there may be chances that they hire you as a, you know, specialized worker, not like as a newly graduate, but basically you, knew how, you know how to do your job kind of thing. So it's very case by case, very company by company. My company is not like the, like most companies in Japan, they still do the traditional job hunting thing and you may have to go through all these interviews and stuff. But um, if you find, you, may, you can find those companies that they, they have, they know what research is, they know how to do research, and they know what you want to do and what you don't want to do, and, and uh, they're more flexible to, for, maybe for you to get in. So you would recommend that um, you should contact maybe people from the company beforehand, or is this maybe too Western aggressive style? <laughs> um, I wouldn't call it aggressive. In the worst case scenario, they would not reply, which means like <laughs> they, you know, maybe, you know, it was not the thing to do, but they wouldn't, nobody will get mad at you. Um, also, like if, if you, like for researchers, like companies who do research, if you go to a conference and there's, there are sometimes company booths where you can talk to the uh, people there directly and they're, they'll be very happy to, to inform you about like how they do their thing. Um, you can also check if they publish papers or not, um, if you're very hardcore. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's, uh, that's what I can advise you. Thank you very much. Maybe Helmut can add. Yeah, I mean, just my, my story was, as I described, that uh, the Sony people were knowing me from the conferences, and uh, then they knew that I'm in Sendai, and uh, then I did... Uh, so the, the position was basically created for me. Uh, was never uh, published or so. But, uh, um, that was this experiment, experience. 
Um, it's a completely different story, but it was much more difficult to get out of the researcher position in a Japanese company. <laughs> but this is a, a different story, maybe. Thank you. Other Thank question? You. Thank you for um, sharing your um, expertise and insights so far. And um, I was wondering, and this question goes to all panelists. Um, we've heard a lot about um, yeah, opportunities for researchers uh, in the fields of science and technology to maybe enter industry. Um, and I was wondering, do you see any opportunities um, for researchers in social science and humanities, like in fields of cultural and language or um, politics and law, to actually um, enter industry um, like internationally or here in Japan, or do you see little chances? Yeah. Anyone from the panelists can? Yes, Iliana, thank you. I think um, um, among the specialties that you mentioned, law is probably the easiest because every company needs to make contracts, those contracts need to be reviewed, and so on and so forth. So every company needs to have some kind of lawyer in some form, whether the person is actually <clears throat> hired directly by the company or through a contractor or uh, is being let, lent out by a law firm for a specified number of hours each week. Uh, for the other specialties, I mean, you also have a lot of Japanese students that don't study like the hardcore science and they are more <laughs> into like social sciences and they are being hired by the same companies. Just the departments that they tend to work in are different. For example, you could go into human resource you could go into sales, you could go into marketing. There are a lot of different um, options where they need a different background than someone who has just studied um, engineering, for example. I have just a short comment. Like, uh, I don't know about like uh, in the in the arts uh, side or social science side. I, I don't know many uh, cases, but um, I know someone who was. Uh, had a PhD in literature, and a game company actually hired, the, hired him as a researcher um, for because they needed someone who knew a lot of like how to write stories for uh, video games and stuff. Um, so there may be hidden chances somehow, but you have to probably do a lot of research uh, to to find those or know people who know. So moving and going to like. Uh, um, uh, job hunting fairs and stuff, it's, it's essential. Also, the language is, is, is essential. But that, that could lead to another panel for uh, this. But um, my, my friend who got the position, he was very fluent in Japanese. Um, maybe two questions. Yes, uh, one at the back side. Um, hello, thank you everyone for the nice um, insights. A little bit to my back background, I'm from Germany. I studied uh, business and information systems uh, in the south of Germany, in Bavaria. And I studied one year at Osaka University as well as in Kyoto. And currently I'm a remote part-time data scientist for a large German enterprise. And I have the following question. Um, do you have any advices for European um, master student, in my case, who is in, uh, proficient in Japanese, German, and English, striving to do a PhD in Japan or Europe based on the competencies, working culture, and opportunities to eventually um, switch to the industry and start his own company? So, and the following up question, um, if you could go back in time, would you do your PhD in Europe or Japan again? Uh, especially this question is related to the researcher from uh, who's working at Siemens, I think, but basically to everyone. Thank you. I would again do the PhD in Germany, not in Japan. Uh, postdoc was okay in Japan, I think, but uh, I, yeah. Um, and so the first question was uh, what is the advice to find a good uh, topic or professor or university or... <laughs> Sorry, uh, yeah, basically the decision between choosing um, a European country or in my case maybe Germany 
um, or Finland, for example, um, or Japan for doing a PhD, basically. Uh, because, for example, for me, I really love the, um, the connection between industry and research at university. So I'm a student, but as well uh, a data scientist in the industry. And as you mentioned, in Germany, we call it Werkstudent, uh, which I haven't seen in Japan so far. And I would like to keep that connection to the industry even throughout my PhD. Um, yes, but uh, I think opportunities are endless, so maybe something is developing in Japan as well. And that's why I'm currently really curious about, like, is it really that bad to do a PhD in, in Japan? As I hear from many PhD people doing it in Japan compared uh, to, to Europe, like from a retro perspective. Not in terms that it's like completely bad, but uh, relatively speaking. I mean, I, I don't say bad, and um, you should ask the people who, who did a PhD in Japan, maybe uh, uh, not uh, me, but uh, from my observation of uh, universities, is that the empowerment is a little bit uh, uh, less here in Japan than in uh, Europe. So I think in Europe, uh, when I was a PhD student, I was feeling like I'm a project manager of, of uh, my own research, plus of the uh, people around I needed. I mean, I needed some substrates actually from Sumitomo Electric, and I got them from Japan, and my professor was at least not doing the micromanagement and said, no, you cannot talk with Sumitomo Electric. I need to talk with the external parties also. But I had a little bit, uh, as we heard your story, for example, that your company, you wanted to do the uh, internship needed to go to your professor, so that's a little bit. Uh, yeah, I wonder what is the why is the uni I mean, there's always for me: is it a PhD student or is it a PhD candidate? Ne? Are you do you want to be more treated like a student still, or more like a researcher already during your PhD time? Uh, I think there is a difference, but uh, I think the people who were more not like postdoc, like me, but studying at Japanese university should right. say something to this, please. Yeah, I, I did my PhD in Japan. Um, I was more motivated to like, I, I was interested in, in Japanese culture. I, I practiced martial arts, um, so I was interested in like, so it was more kind of fulfilling to my private life than uh, rather thinking, oh, of course, Japanese uh, PhD, they, I went to a lab that um, I do it through a scholarship. I got a scholarship, and uh, well, this is funny because when you say um, doing a PhD in Europe, like each country is so different. Like in Spain, there there are not many chances for you to get a scholarship to do your PhD. There's not much funding for, um, like maybe maybe biosciences, but um, so I applied for Spain and, and, and Japan, and they didn't, I didn't get the Spanish scholarship, I got the Japanese one, so, and I, I like the Japanese culture, so I ended up doing it here. Um, the, as, as it was mentioned, uh, the, the PhD culture in Japan, um, you have to be part of this mechanism that is a, a, a lab in which, you know, you are, maybe you're more free in, in, to do what you want in, um, Europe, maybe in Japan, you're you're part of the mechanism. Um, but I think for international students, they most places they understand like we don't move by the same rules, um, and they give you more freedom. So I mean, for me, doing the PhD in Japan was a good experience. Uh, I'm not sure I can not compare it to what ha would happen would have happened if I would do it in Spain. Um, but when you go to a company, you you there's they know you're a foreigner, but you have less freedom because the, the mechanism is more, much more complex. Um, so I'm not really answering your question 100%, but um, if, if you have any specific question, maybe I can, I can uh, answer it better. Yeah, thank you. Uh, no, I mean, I think it kind of ah. answered my question. Okay. Um, maybe if I can say a comment. Uh, I think if you're like, thinking about doing a PhD here in Japan, uh, I think the first thing you should find is a professor. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned, well, I haven't done a PhD. I was considering uh, doing it. And one of the reasons uh, I didn't actually do the PhD is because uh, the professor I did my master thesis with 
Um, he was a good professor. He was like really good, like uh, like let's say managing the, my master thesis. But I couldn't really get much knowledge from from him. Uh, and I thought like for a PhD, I really need like someone that I can actually learn from too, like a really good advisor. And I also couldn't find other professors, so I was like, uh, and after uh, having the experience of the master thesis and how it was, I, I knew that having a good advisor is uh, really important here in Japan. Uh, because, yeah, like all the uh, research in the universities are really focused on your lab. And your lab is kind of an independent unit in the university. Uh, everything is going to go through your professor. Uh, and for example, the funding that was uh, mentioned before too, like your professor is going to get some funds and he's going to distribute uh, those, uh, the money however he wants or she wants. So it's really important to find uh, a professor first, I think, uh, more than where to do the Japan or uh, Germany in your case. I think if you can find a really good professor, a really good advisor here in Japan, uh, you will enjoy your PhD here in Japan. But uh, yeah, search for a good one, have meetings, like uh, really, you should get a, a, like both understand what you want to do on your PhD and agree it before. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. We are kind of running behind the time schedule. So maybe we can discuss more at the reception. So, yeah, but uh, for the final question, there was some question, maybe one question. Yes. Thank you that I can ask. Um, so I was like briefly, my question is like, who does your research belong to when you're working um, as a researcher at a company? Like, because um, when I did an internship at the German uh, um, car company, um, the um, engineering and, and economic students who wrote their thesis at the company, they had to like sign a contract that whatever result comes out belongs to the company. And so I, I think you were talking about selling your soul to the devil. And for me, from a social science perspective, this is kind of selling your mind to the company. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, um, I guess it's also case by case, depends on the company. Um, for us, we want to make sure that whatever do we do research on, we publish it on an on a academic conference so it's available to everyone. Um, some companies, they don't understand why we do that, so it depends on, on, the, on the place. But maybe, as you said, like, unfortunately, there's still a lot of cases where they, th they believe because they paid you and, they, and you worked for them during that period, then they owe I mean, they own everything uh, you did for them, but yeah, I guess it's case by case. Thank you very much. And now the time is up, so um, we have to finish. But um, pl thank you very much for uh, joining the round table today. And please give them a big round of applause. He is a minister counsel of EU delegations and at the same time managing director of EU Japan Center for Industry Cooperation. And thank you very much for coming today and the floor is yours. Good evening everyone. Um, I'll make it short. I know that there is a reception waiting for you and you're already running late. I just wanted to take this opportunity to present you um, very briefly what we do at the managing um, the EU Japan Center for Industrial Cooperation in relation to, um, to uh, research and, um, and also for students. So very briefly, so first of all, what is the EU Japan Center for Industrial Cooperation? So this is really a unique joint venture between the European Commission and um, the METI, the, the Japanese ministry. It's been founded 35 years ago, and uh, really the objective is to support um, cooperation between uh, European uh, and Japanese businesses. Um, but you will see it's much more than this. So this, this, these are all the activities that we are supporting. Um, we have 30, about around 40 staff. Uh, most of them are in, in Japan, but we also have an office based in Brussels. Um, so we provide training uh, activities, business services, uh, uh, policy seminars, uh, uh, reports, um, and cooperation on research and development, um, 
also cooperation between regions, and then we work together with uh, with um, member states uh, trade promotion organization. So I will I will focus on on certain uh, aspect of those services which I think are probably more relevant for you. Uh, that is the the cooperation on innovation and research and development. So first of all, the um, the um, Japan Center is the national contact point for our region Europe. So. That is, we um, we promote the uh, the Horizon Europe program uh, across Japan to, to try to um, to uh, also um, make known this program and that that Japanese companies uh, and, and and research organization uh, can take part in this in this program and researchers as well. And you're probably aware that uh, there is all this, this uh, ongoing um, discussion about the possibility of, of having um, Japan uh, being an associated country to the Horizon Europe program. Uh, we also run a technology transfer help desk. This is quite unique. Um, there we, um, we provide um, uh, technologies uh, which are patented to, to interested, uh, uh, to interested uh, companies. Uh, would like to, to use those technologies. And then uh, on the other hand, we also um, um, provide uh, some, some um, information to, to those who are looking for, uh, for, for uh, cooperation or, or partners or collaboration um, with researcher or, or, or companies. Um, so I, I encourage you to have a look. Uh, if you type in uh, technology transfer help desk uh, on the internet, you will, you will find it. Um, yeah, we also promote uh, cooperation between um, between industrial clusters uh, and regions, and uh, for this we organize matchmaking missions, for instance, uh, where we have um, clusters from Europe who come over to to Japan to meet uh, their counterparts uh, here in Japan. And finally, we also have an activity. Um, to support cooperation between European and Japanese companies in the field of, of, of uh, space. Um, and there we'll regularly uh, seminars, workshops, and also we support uh, missions by, by European companies who, who come to Japan. Then maybe interesting for you also, we have this, um, what we call this um, Vulcanus program. So we, there is two strands of the Vulcanus program. There's one Vulcanus in Europe, which is, uh, for um, Japanese students uh, who want to um, to have an experience in, in uh, European companies, so and the other way around, we have Vulcanus in Japan, where we um, invite we we found um, Japanese uh, European students to come over for one year in Japan, in in um, as we're doing an internship uh, of eight months in um, in, a, in a Japanese companies, and before that, we we finance uh, four months of intensive language uh, course here in uh, in Tokyo. So this is a very popular program uh, where, where we have a lot of demand and very uh, qualified uh, students, usually in their master uh, the program. Um, so if you're interested, I encourage you to have a look. We are trying to, um, to increase the number of students which can benefit from this program. Um, actually, maybe not with that we have more fun, but also to, to offer the opportunity for companies if they want to fund uh, one hundred percent the 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 internship that they could do it so for the moment we we do not um share this information uh, of of the the pool of students which apply, but this could be something that we will do in the future so that you, know, you also have uh, students have more opportunities to find a, 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 an internship in, in Japan or in Europe depending where where you're coming from um, yeah, these are uh, all other activities that we are doing. This, but, but, yeah, I mean, this this might be interesting if if you plan to set up a company, so you already have a company. So we have all sorts of services to to help uh, um, do business in Japan for startups. Um, yeah, and maybe interesting that I wanted to show you is about the uh, Vulcanus. I spoke about it. Minerva program, yes, Minerva program. This is also uh, we, we so we found um, uh, researchers to do um, in-house uh, research and article uh, report for six months. Um, 
on specific uh, economic and industrial issues. Uh, this year, we, are, we have four students who started in, well, students, we call it student or their researcher who started in September, uh, and they, will, they are focusing, uh, one is doing um, the research on um, uh, circular economy in the textile sectors, fashion uh, industry, and, and or, or Japan and you could cooperate. There's one on the automotive industry, one on, on uh, supply chains, and one on the defense sector. So. This we publish a call uh, every year where we invite uh, uh, where we invite proposals to 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 to, to be uh, to be made. So voila, I think that's uh, that's all I wanted to say for the for this short presentation. I, if you have any questions, if you have an interest, please don't don't hesitate to to come to see me and, and otherwise contact me by email. Voila, that's it. This is the end of the event, the European Research Days Japan 2022, and I hope you enjoyed and have got some takeaways. And if you have any questions on today's uh, events, uh, or your access Japan in general, we help uh, researchers uh, in Japan or in Europe link together. So if you have any inquiries, please contact us at japan.euraccess.net. We also have a wide variety of events upcoming. For more information, please check our portal and also follow us on SNS, such as Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Line. Um, I would like to invite uh, everyone here on site to the reception at the lobby outside, uh, outside of the hall. And once again, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. And we are looking forward to seeing you on the future events. Thank you very much. Have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye.